Welcome back guys to the JPS podcast and this is a very unique episode of the podcast because this is part two of the coaching round table with myself, Dave McConey and Steve Hall of Revive Stronger. So part one of this episode was on Dave's channel, Brains and Gains, and you guys should check that out before watching this one. And if you haven't, I will link in the description box below uh, the link to that video. So guys, in this episode, uh, we continue our discussion and we discuss making comparisons to other people uh, in fitness and why this may not necessarily be a good thing. We talk about applying studies to trainees, uh, training a non-responder, as well as beyond the X's and O's of coaching. So again, I'm really honored to have been asked to go on Dave's channel uh, to discuss coaching, some of the philosophies we have at JPS and our experiences, and I'm very uh, privileged to have learned a lot from both Dave and Steve throughout this conversation, as I'm sure you guys will also. So. I hope you guys enjoy this episode. Without further ado, Dave and Steve, as well as myself, on coaching and everything in between. Yeah, I think I just wanted to say on Jacob's points because um, mm. I don't want people to think that I don't know. And I'm sure Jacob didn't mean it in this way that I we don't utilize like well, rather me, I don't utilize like my reps and supersets and things. Mm. Absolutely do, but it's more requirement on the client side to communicate to me that they require like a shorter time um mm -hmm. if the sessions are getting too long whereas i guess jacob a lot of the time you're in person so you can see if the sessions are getting a bit out of hand so and also i have a fewer number of these sort of clients but i have some clients who do a very similar approach where we very react reactive with deloads because mm -hmm. they are quite gen pop and so there's just no point we don't even accumulate in the same way that i might with someone who else who is more along the lines of what i'm kind yeah. of doing so I think that was sure. um, good points that Jacob made, and I just think that's also some things that I would utilize as well. And I think in terms of your comments there, uh, with the MEV, like MAV, MRV, there's a big window for most people between kind of MEV and MRV. This is why so many programs will then work, depending on, and you can just, as long as you're progressively overloading, you're within this zone, it might be much of a muchness of the results that you're going to eventually see if volume is pretty much equated as most studies show mm -hmm. you don't see much difference in results so i think it's absolutely fair to say like i'm going to train with just a static slightly higher volume for like a number of weeks you might cycle between these do we know which one's going to be better we can't i don't think anyone can argue that one is definitely better than the other and i'd struggle to even really have someone make many arguments to say that one's like right. even without evidence so it is a case of what do you like what have you seen results with and for me it's just been a case of i found something that worked and it's been working and i'm just going with it and i don't want to mess it up i don't want to change it because there's no need to sure mm -hmm. yeah i definitely agree with steve just to to add to that that when you find something that works and that makes sense to you and you understand the, the application of the concepts and the ideas uh, yeah, I think it's totally understandable to to buy into that you know system, um, and it, no one can really say with any great degree of certainty that there is a better way because how do you know? Nobody really knows. Um, I do what I know works because I've seen it work for myself and my clients. Um, is that to say that there isn't a better way? I'm not sure. Could I do things differently? Most definitely, but at the same time, if I'm producing consistent results, there's a very small window in which, or a degree to which I'm willing to experiment to try new things because I think the, the purpose of experimentation is changing one variable at a time uh, to see uh, you know, the magnitude of the you know, change uh, that you want to elicit. And you never want to really steer too far away from what you know is working um, because then you're just throwing shit at a wall and hoping it sticks, and that's not coaching. Um, so I think the the evolution of these concepts in application, uh, you know, in what we do with ourselves and our clients, should be this continual refinement, uh, you know, and like dialing things up and down, you know. And, and again, there's so many moving parts in terms of recovery, you know, sleep, nutrition, stress, all these factors. That fuck, you might be able to dial things up for a mesocycle. Something could happen. You have to dial it back down. So there's no specific number or approach. And I think, like you said, Dave, I think holding things constant is just a safer bet. Um, and like Steve said, in situations where you have someone 
who is OCD with their training, their diet, their sleep, like Steve is, fuck, you're going to get a great, like a super, super predictable, uh, you know, outcome in training performance. So having these, you know, planned and very uh, linear progressions in volume is totally fine. And I can see why and how that would work. But I think for most people, that they're just not as dialed in to, to all of the, the variables as Steve is. So just a more conservative approach would work. And I think Steve knows this and agrees with this, as he mentioned, you know, as more reactive and uh, very, uh, you know, steady and slower progressions for, for individuals who are gen pop and whatnot. So I think, yeah, the volume landmarks definitely exist. How you get to maximum recovery volume, well, you know, you know, sets is one way of progressing, you know, volume, so is reps, so is load. Like, again, you've got to compare apples to apples. How are you, you know, quantifying volume? Are you talking about number of hard sets per week? Are you talking about volume load? Are you talking about effective reps? It's very important that when we have these discussions that we're all on the same page in terms of our definitions because when you have a definition uh, that is clearly accepted by, you know, the masses or the people at least, uh, you know, discussing this topic, uh, you can then have a very effective discussion about it. But I think a lot of the problems, especially online in the evidence-based community, is just that people don't understand that you know, when we talk about volume, some people are talking about hard sets per week per muscle group at an RP of six or more, for example, uh, and others are talking about volume load or, you know, they just don't understand what it, what it means um, or, you know, somebody's interpretation of it. So, yeah, I think the concepts are fantastic and I think there's many ways to apply it um, but at the end of the day, you know, I guess the, the best metric we have, and I think Steve will agree and many people, uh, you know, who are very well versed with uh, hypertrophy training will agree that the best metric we have uh, for progression is how you look in the mirror. If you look bigger in the fucking mirror, your scale weight is climbing and your body composition is holding relatively steady, then what you're doing is fucking working. Uh, if, if it's working, keep doing it, keep refining it, make very small adjustments to what you're doing um, and, and assess from there. But yeah, I think if it, if it works, it works. Um, we, we don't know enough. Like I, I love when people ask me, you know, these specific questions about, you know, what's the best way to program for hypertrophy. And, and to be frank, I don't fucking know. Nobody knows. <laughs> Anyone who tells you they have the answer is is talking shit and they might as well go with the banana girl and start selling you know bananas because they're, they're lying <laughs> um you know we we are making our best guess based on our experience and we are continually experimenting uh based on what we're learning through the scientific literature but even then i think that the problem a lot of people are making is they're waiting for science to give them a whole path to experiment and try things when in reality, science is never going to be at a point where it's going to give us a clear enough direction as to what to do. Like a lot of the studies that are, that are conducted are either not on the populations that we're working with or that apply to us, or they're absolutely horrible studies. They're not long enough. They don't control nutrition. There's just, you know, whatever the case may be. It's like we're learning more about the mechanistic stuff, but at the end of the day, we're in the applied, uh, yeah, we're applying science. We're not there, you know, looking at, you know, changes in, you know, myofibrils and all these sorts of things. We are looking at, is this person getting bigger visually? Are they getting, you know, stronger? Are they recovering? Are they, you know, progressing in their training? Um, and if we're doing these things, then I think we just need to use the concepts and theories that we know, um, but don't get too caught up in, in the weeds, you know, with, with these kind of things. You know, it's like paint those broad strokes and then, you know, chip in the details and uh, refine it over time. But yeah my two cents on that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you brought up, um, you know, Steve's kind of OCD-ness. And I, I mean, I don't know if you guys were back on like the forums, if you ever went on them. <laughs> Steve's, um, look, Steve, he's just <laughs> scratching his knees. You bastards. <laughs> hey, I'm realizing I have the weakest beard here right now. <laughs> Steve, Steve, I'm just jealous, man, because I train like three times a week at the moment. So the fact that you get, you get almost my weekly training sessions in one day, it just, it just eats at me, man. Yeah, so like back on those those forums, I used to be called OCD all the time, and now I'm I'm like fine with it. But back then, it was like this insult, like you're overthinking things. But that's just how I've always been. You know, I, I wanted to know every little detail and all the science. But uh, we have to realize, like most people aren't like that. Most people aren't like Steve or even like you, Jacob. Like as much as we like to delve into the specifics and we like to find that one percent difference, uh, most most people don't really care. You know, I mean, as much as we find it interesting, most people don't. 
Um, and most people just want to get the results. And so I think Steve's method, and I mean, again, it's not Steve's method, but that application um, is very interesting and maybe it is idealized, but it's kind of like when we, you know, we're talking mostly on training, but same thing goes with diet, right? We can argue about does a keto versus a higher car versus, I mean, even like carnivore diet, people are talking about, you know, all these methods, they work to put you in a calorie deficit, right? And that's what gets you 90% of the health benefits and 90% of the visual benefits. And so it, it's awesome to look at the studies, but at the end of the day, most of our clients, I think, are a little bit more simple than that. And they just kind of want results. And we have to consider that when I think if I were to tell my clients, OK, this week we're going to do this. And then I want you to tell me how that felt, how many reps you had left. So we're going to then up that set. It just gets so complicated that then the attrition rate gets a lot higher. Yeah, I really like I like what Jacob said there, and I like what you brought up in it's like Pareto's law where you get 80% of the results from 20% of the things that you do. And I, and it's funny that you say kind of I'm OCD and I do it. I think I attract quite a lot of people like that. Um, and it's funny cause I have to remind them of this Pareto's law and how we can relax quite a lot. And in a lot of the time I'm actually making them become less obsessed with things um, and less focused on all of that. But I guess something that you guys were talking and when Jacob was talking, it made me really think of this. Something I do as a coach with my clients is I really, really try and get them to understand their body and understand the impact of different variables. So like volume, ex certain exercises, sleep, nutritional timing, all of these elements, I'm really getting them to understand their own body. Because once you understand you and you're seeing kind of the inputs and the outputs, you can actually move towards your optimal. And this is what I've done for myself this off season is like so great. And a lot of people go through programs, they go through nutritional protocols, they go through like all of them, and they don't even think about what's happening to them, to their body. They're just doing it without any kind of guidance. And I just love, like you guys have already spoken about, bringing them down to like the bare basics and small little changes that they can see a positive and moving them closer and closer towards what's their quote unquote optimal, which is always moving anyway. So uh, yeah, I just wanted to add that a little bit. Sure. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add to that really quickly because this is completely unrelated but extremely important. We are facing a very large problem in the fitness industry whereby people are now continuously and very frequently exposed to other people's training, their results, their nutrition, and inherently making comparisons, which is drawing their focus away from their their grass they're focusing on everyone else's grass and it always looks greener and all of a sudden they stop paying attention and this is something that like i just found out the other day that instagram you can see what other people have liked and what they're liking on instagram because i literally don't use instagram to look at other people's stuff so you don't consume I, it <laughs> i don't consume it i go on and i i use it for a specific purpose and I was somewhat naive, but I'm very much aware of how uh, influential it is in distracting people and taking their focus away from their own life. And not only is this, I'm not going to get into a big rant about, you know, self-esteem and that's, uh, you know, downstream effects on self-efficacy and competency, uh, you know, which is hugely important if we're trying to be, you know, elite level bodybuilders or at least achieve, uh, you know, our potential in terms of our fitness goals. Uh, but nonetheless that distraction takes away from somebody's ability to objectively measure and assess and then manage uh, you know, their results and their progress because they're continuously looking at all of the other people on social media who are doing all these different things who aren't them and again, they're just distracted. They're unable to look at what's happening in real time in their life and make the necessary changes to their programs uh, that they need to because they're just so preoccupied with everything else. And I think, uh, you know, like Steve said, just learning to uh, you know, be very much uh, aware and self-aware of what's going on with your diet, your training, your outcomes is super important. I think is critical to becoming, you know, the, the best version of yourself, you know, whether that's on the bodybuilding stage, powerlifting platform, or just, you know, how you look naked. Uh, and I think a great example of this is Alberto Nunes. I think his ability to, you know, uh, in, introspect uh, and, you know, assess and understand who he is and how, you know, he ticks, what works for him and just, you know, figure himself out 
has been why he's got to the top of his game and why he's been such a good coach uh, because he, he realizes that, cool, we need to pay attention to this science because it's going to tell us, you know, kind of where to start and what to do with things. But once we get that baseline, it's all about N equals one. Like, let's really look in and who the fuck is, are we applying this shit to? Um, and I, I think, you know, just as a, a little side note to what Steve mentioned, I just want to draw attention to this because I think there are so many people who are just getting completely baffled by bullshit online, what everyone else is doing. And I hope the listeners and, and anyone out there who is made, has made it this far, um, you know, given my Australian accent and Steve's, uh, you know, hat there, um, you know, see, it's, it's not <laughs> you don't want to see what's underneath. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I just hope they start, this could be a wake up call and they start really paying attention to, to what's going on in their lives. Awesome, man. Um, and, yeah, I like that you talked before about like these studies that we have and a lot of them are, you know, really crappy studies or the population is not the best. I mean, unfortunately we just can't often study, you know, elite bodybuilders, um, and I don't, I don't know if you guys have been involved in any research. I was for a year. And yeah. you see the behind the scenes, man. And a it's lot of times work. it's, yeah, like, mm. especially like in a college setting. I mean, I was kind of running it um, and with my girlfriend at the time. And we were kind of like running the lab. But it was, you know, so much of it. Like I would come in and people were already starting. And like I hadn't given them the right protocol. I mean, and I'm not saying that's everywhere, of course. Mm. But I'm just saying that a lot of times you don't, it, it made me, not trust the results of a lot of studies when I saw it. And I was like, uh, you know, how, how well was that really run? That person who was supposed to be pushed to failure, were they really pushing to failure, especially if they were new to training? Probably not, you know? So that's why, uh, you know, one of the topics we were talking about is how do we apply research? And the research is great. Um, I, I think we all read mass with uh, Eric Helms, Zordos and Greg Knuckles, but um, that stuff's really cool. But a lot of times at the end of the day, like you said, it does end up being N equals one. And, and just find out what works for the individual because sometimes these studies just don't apply to the people that we're working with. Yeah, man, for sure. And just to, to clarify, I wasn't knocking uh, the science or the researchers. Uh, sure. you know, I, I, I actually think that probably the last two or three years, the, the quality of research and even the participant just skyrocketed. Like I know, you know, Mike was involved in, uh, you know, the volume study that was mm -hmm. you know, hev heavily uh, popularized with uh, you know the having the most amount of volume in a six week period, um, yeah, and those people lifted man. They like I saw photos on uh, Greg uh, Knuckles' recent uh, review uh, of that paper, and you know those participants they were pretty freaking jacked man. Um, so I think there's been a, a big push towards getting better research, uh, which has been fantastic. And again, I'm not throwing uh, stones from a glass house here, um, but I just wanted to yeah make sure that people are aware that. Yeah, the research we've had for so many years has been very lackluster, and now it's just starting to pick up, mm -hmm. and we just still aren't aren't aware of too much just yet. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't remember which one of you guys brought up the topic, but something we were talking about is um, how do we deal with a, a, an apparent non-responder to training? Um, I, don't, I don't remember which ask, one of you it was. Ask Steve. Ask Steve. He's a non-responder. <laughs> <laughs> You want to go I first, Steve? I can, yeah, I can actually talk to this. I don't know if it's, it's really interesting because I don't know who I see. I've seen someone say this quite a few times where they're like, they just don't agree that there's non-responders. It might have been Jared Feather. Um, he sometimes comes out with these quite controversial statements where he's just like, bullshit, there's no no-responders to hypertrophy, which I, I'm not well-versed enough in the literature to try and state what that is saying. But in my experience through training people, I've had people who you, who have thought they're non-responders um, and I've coached them for long periods of time and I've never had a true non-responder. I've just had slow burners. And you look at their progress over short, like monthly periods and like, it doesn't look like there's much going on, but you look over like years and like, it's impressive. They make impressive gains. And I think it was um, Greg Nichols and Mike Isretel who came on my podcast a while ago and they talked about genetics and they talked about you have people who in years will just have a very sharp linear and they'll be like at their genetic peak or close to that in a short period of time. You have slow burners who they eventually get there. They just need more time. And in my own experience, that's what it's been. And it hasn't been a case of you have to do something really different or you have to try different like scary methods. They aren't a special snowflake. They're just slow at seeing that progress come along. Um, and I think being aware that that is a thing, it solves a lot of issues because they become very anxious, they become very mm. obsessive, they become OCD, and you have to bring them away from that because it doesn't help their results. They become program hoppers, 
and it's that traditional consistency over time of the basics, the foundations, um, which funny enough, kind of talking about the science and how um, like it's, it's good, but it, it's getting better, but it's, it doesn't change the foundations. The foundations are the foundations. They're always going to be the principles that we're going to use methods from. Um, so I just think, for, yeah, from my experience, it's been a case of apply those principles, those foundations, eke them over time, but it's that consistency of applying them that's really seen the results come along eventually. Yeah, Sorry, Jacob. yeah. Yeah, Steve brings up a lot of good points there. I, I definitely agree. I haven't seen anyone who hasn't responded to resistance training. Definitely some people just take a lot longer to see progress. I think it was James Krieger at our conference last year. It presented a study. I think it was like Erskine at all. 2010, they had like 17 untrained men. Uh, they did uh, leg extensions three times a week uh, for nine weeks. Um, anyway, they found like a tenfold variation uh, between individuals in terms of their progress, and they had some individuals who actually regressed. It was like it was really interesting, um, but I think while some people will respond really quickly, some slowly. What's interesting to me is, as a coach, how I approach this with someone. Because, like Steve said, if you say to somebody who's making slow progress that they're a non-responder, that can have many, uh, many serious implications uh, for how they. Uh, you know, are motivated and how they exert effort towards their training. Uh, there, was a, a, uh, there was a study that uh, assessed the genetic placebo effect for performance and hunger um, just recently. And they found simply by telling uh, the participants uh, that they had a low performance uh, CREB1 gene variant, uh, they performed slower on a treadmill relative to their baseline test, regardless of their actual genotype. And that negatively altered their like mm. cardiorespiratory physiology. So, um, you know, that, that's phenomenal. Like that just goes to show the power of placebo. So I think if you tell someone, Hey, you're a non-responder, well, you don't fucking know. So, so don't tell someone that, right. It's, it's similar to saying to someone that they have adrenal fatigue. Like I've had, you know, clients come to me and they've had a coach tell them that they have adrenal fatigue. It's like, dude, do you know what you were doing to this person by telling them that? Uh, and I think the same can be said for, uh, you know, telling someone they're a non-responder because it can really dampen how much they mobilize effort towards training uh, and, in, you know, they're buying to the process, all these sorts of things. So I think that's the first, uh, you know, way that I approach a non-responder is that I don't really treat them like a non-responder and I certainly don't, uh, you know, tell them that they're a non-responder or make them feel like there's something wrong with them. Um, but I guess in my experience, people who just are a little bit slower to make progress, usually they're the ones who just, aren't as well put together, uh, you know, they're not as athletic, they just don't move as well. So spending a lot more time dialing in technique and form, um, you know, making sure that they can feel the target muscle group. So, you know, non-responders generally have a harder time, you know, longer limbs, for example, uh, you know, their insertions aren't that great and they just have a harder time, you know, contracting the muscle and feeling it. Uh, so, you know, working on developing the mind-muscle connection, whether it's activation drills prior to main list, such as, you know, pec activation drills, lack activation drills, those things can help. Um, and just paying attention, like you really got to pay attention. If something starts working, like whoa, keep it going, don't change it. If something's not working, you really have to start looking at nutrition. Usually, you know, the people who are slower to make progress are the ones who, you know, under eat chronically or misreport, they, they think they're always full, uh, you know, they've got high activity levels, so they need to through the roof, they sleep like shit, their lifestyle might not be in order, um, and then, yeah, if they, you find exercises that work for these people, um, they have a good mind-muscle connection on, milk it and keep milking it, you know, just <laughs> emphasize to them that, hey, we need to keep this in there, it doesn't matter how bored you get with it, you just got to keep going, you know, for as long as possible until things slow down. And when you find things at work, whether it's a rep range, a loading zone, an exercise, uh, you know, just continue to eke out as much as you can on that. Um, because, again, with these people who are just slower to respond, if you have too many changes, uh, it can take a long time to build up that momentum again to start seeing progress. Uh, you really want to make sure if you're making progress that you sort of get as much out of that as possible before you uh, start making changes. For sure, yeah. And as far as the research, I mean, like you said, there, there are studies out there showing non-responders, but again, you have to look at how, like, the methodology of the study. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes in these studies, you know, they'll show it's older people, um, and also oftentimes like older women, like elderly that aren't responding. And, you know, I mean, how intense is that training really at that age? And, you know, that's really, again, not the population we're talking about. Um, are these 
studies having the people gain weight because obviously that's going to be a factor in putting on muscle as well. Um, but yeah, I, I do like that it, it at least brings to light the huge variability in responses, you know, mm-hmm. because I think it's finally a little bit more accepted now that genetics are a huge component of this. And it really, you know, it wasn't talked about as much back when I was getting into this. I mean, again, going back to the, the lovely teen nation days, and I remember I was like 16. So I had been training for a couple of years at that point. And I remember people telling me, like, if you're not 200 pounds already, like, you're doing this wrong. And I'm like, like I said, I'm like a 16-year-old. And I'm just like, uh, all right. I guess. I'm like, I mean, I really, it really kind of mentally got to me. I was thinking I'm doing something wrong. Like, what else can I do? Um, and it, it messed with me for a while. And I'm glad now that people are kind of coming to light. And we'll see even like, I mean, look at the difference between, um, you know, even like Alberto Nunez or Jeff Alberts and Brad Loomis. You know, I had Brad Loomis on a couple months ago. And we talked about one of the reasons I respect him is because, you know, by his own um, statements, he's probably the, the least impressive physically of the 3DMJ crew, but he's put in 25 years and he's still built a great physique and he's still very strong for his weight. Um, but, you know, he competes at 155 and you've got other guys who have been doing it for a similar time competing at 180, right? I mean, 25 different, 25 pounds of muscle there is, is a huge difference. And so I am glad at least the studies do show this huge variability because I think People who maybe are, like you said, slow burners, Steve, they, they maybe won't get down on themselves as much and think, well, I just suck or I'm doing this wrong. You know, they just think, OK, if I put in some time, I'll eventually improve a lot. It might not be an elite level physique, but it'll be a lot better than what I started with. You know, yeah, I think those I mean, you and Jacob both made excellent points. I really like the, the placebo as well. Um, mm-hmm. It's kind of like the hard gainers. In that they think they're a hard gainer, and now they are a hard gainer. Like your, your body follows mind, and the people I've worked with who have been those slow burners or kind of they think that they are a non-responder, I, I have to coach them out of that and be like, no, like look, like we've you can see you've progressed with your strength, you can see your physique looks better, and they're like, sometimes their body dysmorphia and they really can't see it, and it just takes time and time and time, and so I think a lot of the time, unfortunately these are probably the least coachable people for a lot of people because they're difficult to deal with. Um, like I, I like coaching these people because this is like, I, I, I'm, this is why I feel like I'm a good coach and I'm sure you guys are the same because you can really help this person who is just, they have a very hard time. These are the people that need the most hand holding and the most encouragement. Um, so I love that point. And Fuck that, man. <laughs> I want to I work with genetic freaks only, bro. They make me look better. <laughs> Uh, that's very so, true but you can even think i i can't believe none of it like i never thought about genetics i was just like you see sprinters and you're like he's the world best sprinter and you're like oh that's fine like obviously he he has great genetics for that whereas we don't think that about them bodybuilding even though when you're in like school there's like that there's always the kid with like a six pack who's freaking jacked yeah and you're all, none of you are going and lifting weights <laughs> Yeah, I think that probably irritates me more than like anything else in this field is somebody saying, no, man, it's just hard work. It's like, bro, I'm not saying you didn't work hard. I'm saying you got these elite genetics. I mean, nobody would be like, well, if you just ran more, you could be the next Usain Bolt. Like everybody (laughs) understands in sports. But when it comes to lifting, I think people just don't want to admit it sometimes. Either they have great genetics and they don't want to admit that it wasn't just hard work. Or if they're new to training, they don't want to admit to themselves that maybe they'll never be elite, you know, and it, it takes usually, you know, a few years, they'll, they'll understand that most of the time. Um, but it can be hard because I think everybody, you know, this is something that people get very passionate about and you see yourself changing. Um, and it can be hard to accept that, you know, maybe regardless of the work, you won't achieve, you know, that level. Um, so I think it's just kind of hard. So I uh, want to look like Doug Miller. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fuck that, uh, man. <laughs> Steve, I think uh, Jacob and I will you lead this one because you talked about the X's and O's of coaching. We weren't entirely sure what you meant there, so we'll let just you, you want a kiss and a hug, Steve? Is that what you want? <laughs> <laughs> that would also be good, and it actually relates a little bit to what the X's and O's are. So um, I believe it might have been Berto who talked about the X's and O's of coaching. In that, this is what coaching is. It isn't the kind of or. or I think it was apart from the X's and O's or whatever it might be outside of the data. So this is the stuff that is what the video check-ins are all about. When you're one-on-one, it's those discussions with your coach, um, with your client. And it's kind of getting to the, all the personal things that go on. Like you're, everyone like, is emotionally attached to their training. They're emotionally attached to their eating. And it's identifying that and really talking people through things. That is the different, and that's coaching. 
um, because no one's a robot and you can program something perfectly for someone, but you need to know about how they are enjoying it, um, whether or not they're feeling something properly, whether or not they've got stresses in their life, these sort of things that go unseen. This is where the coaching comes in because then you have to manipulate the variables to them. And I think, <coughs> sorry, without even trying, we've kind of talked about this in like throughout the podcast where we talked about individualization basically and this is the x's and o's that often get missed or rather this is everything outside of the x's and o's that we should incorporate within coaching this what makes a coach not even a good coach this is what makes a coach just having a pro you might as well buy a program online if that's all your coach is doing for you is give you numbers right yeah um i think that's almost like the biggest part of it right because so much of this, I mean, you can find most of the stuff online. If you just want a routine, you can just go online now. I mean, maybe that wasn't the case 15 years ago, but it is now. And a huge part of it, I mean, I would say the biggest hurdle I have when I'm taking on somebody new is like, you know, what's your past history with this? You know, do they have any mental holdups? You know, do they have an issue with like, and maybe not a full eating disorder, but maybe an unhealthy relationship with food? Um, do they have, you know, different things that they're thinking about that hold them back? Uh, like Jacob was talking about, you know, that I think is a huge part of it is like you said, literally coaching them through the process and not just telling them eat this or do that. I mean, that, that's great. And sometimes you do have to just do, be that like straightforward person with them because somebody's maybe they're kind of slacking off. And you just have to say, no, this is what we're doing. But a lot of the times it, it's because they're not a robot that you have to be very individual with them. Um, so Jacob, what do you think? Man, that is coaching. It is, uh, as I teach my mentorship students, you want to get to know your clients like the back of your hand. You want to know what makes them tick. You need to know their cat's name. You know, I, I very much, when I start working with someone, <laughs> you guys must think I'm hilarious. Um, <laughs> or I'm cutting out one of the two. Um, <laughs> it's the cat's name that got me. <laughs> yeah, so, um, when I start working with something, something that I do that's a little bit abstract and I guess slightly absurd is I, I really try to visualize a day in my client's life like what does a day in their life look like from the minute they wake up how does everything unfold in their life so that I can at least you know have this imaginative conceptual understanding of what they're dealing with what troubles and issues they're going to be facing because coaching is all about problem solving and that's going to take on something very uh, take on a different meaning for every individual that you work with some people like you mentioned might have you know body dysmorphia you know issues with their their relationship with food all these sorts of things that you have to troubleshoot others it will be motivation it will be dealing with exogenous uh, you know factors you know that dampen their motivation towards uh, training a diet so on and so forth um, everyone's gonna have something something that they need uh, solved and that's the job of a coach is to be able to quickly and swiftly identify problems and issues and devise a very practical solution that influences change and modification in behavior uh, that will influence the outcomes that they want, which are desirable towards their goals. Uh, and I think good coaches just know how to do this. They're very systematic in how uh, they gather information and data, data not necessarily being scale, weight, height, body composition, these kind of things, but information, whether it's qualitative, quantitative, and learning how to decipher and dissect that information uh, to, to get to the root of uh, the problem. And I think, you know, shit, there's, there's, no an there's no way to learn this but practice. And be aware that your job as a coach is to help people. And helping means troubleshooting problems. Uh, you know, and, and this can be quite daunting and very, very uh, taxing and draining. It can be sometimes a very easy and quick process and you can, uh, you know, overcome certain hurdles and obstacles in, in days, weeks, a session, you know, one Skype, whatever the case may be, sometimes it takes months and years, um, you know, but, but it is an investment on the behalf of the coach to commit to helping this person, uh, you know, reach their potential. And that means uh, minimizing the, the holes within their fitness. And, and that can take on uh, a different meaning for everyone that you work with. But yeah, I think the the role of a coach is, and it can be tough because the the line between programming and coaching is very blurry uh, it's like you could write a program and that's all the client wants if they only want you to write a program like for example I'm getting coached by Brian at the moment I just want him to write my program you know mm -hmm. if, if I need any further advice I'll ask but 
But I, I call him my coach. He's just giving me a program. You know, I don't need a lot more from Brian at this point. Um, but I still call him my coach, and I, I am very happy with the work that he's doing. Um, but a lot of other, it depends on where they're at in their fitness journey. Because somebody could be a beginner, they're going to need a lot more accountability, hand holding. They're going to need you to guide them, you know, step by step, uh, and make sure that they don't, you know, step on, you know, a nail and you know, pierce their foot, for example. That was a horrible example, but whatever. It's like one thirty in the morning, for fuck's sake. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, but somebody else might be very competent. I think the more that somebody, you know, becomes autonomous for their training, uh, the more competent they become, uh, the more re relatedness they have. This is all related to self-determination theory. Uh, but essentially, the more, uh, you know, self-sufficient the individual becomes, the less they're going to need their coach. Um, and that's my goal as a coach. Mm. My goal is to have my clients become autonomous where I literally just need to give them numbers because they can handle everything themselves. They don't need me to you know, emotionally support them, to motivate them, to keep them accountable. They're, they're doing it on their own. I'm just there to, to guide them and paddle them in the right direction and steer the ship. Um, so in fact, my goal as a coach is to become redundant for my clients. Um, and when I've done that, like I coach pretty much all of the JPS coaches and I've got many of them now who literally come to me every couple of months and say, hey, this is my program, uh, this is what I want to do in the off-season, for example, uh, what do you think, any you know, changes, should I do a mini-cut, like down this point, yada, yada, yada. Um, I say, yeah, cool, you're on the right track, this looks good, and I let them go. And then you know, when they really need me, if it's a contest prep or whatnot, then I'm there and you know, I take over a little bit more. But for the most part, I want to, I've taught you all I need to do, I, I can teach you, you know, you know enough to achieve your goals, I'll handball that, you know, pass the baton over to you, off you go. Um, because I think if you you assume responsibility for coaching people uh, for the rest of their lives, and I, and I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing, but I think it should get to a point where the coaching uh, comes more so from the client. You're just guiding, not coaching necessarily. You're mentoring more so than coaching. Um, if you're coaching the same people all the time, uh, in my opinion, uh, if I'm coaching the same person 10 years down the track, um, and they, they're not developing to a point where they could probably do it themselves, unless they hire me for a different reason. This is a co different conversation, but if someone hires me to coach them and to teach them everything I know so that they can you know, do it themselves, then, then that's what I want to do. But if someone hires me because they need the accountability, for example, that's a different kettle of fish. If someone mm -hmm. hires me because they want to come to a session and just chat with me and vent you know, for 30 minutes, well, whatever, I'll do that for 20 years if I like you, right? Um, but if somebody comes into the coaching process and they want uh, to essentially be their own agent who is free from, uh, you know, influence of other people and they, they can learn and they make decisions themselves, I think most people fit the bill here, um, then I really want to be working with a person for a couple of years, hopefully teach them as much as I can and then be able to help the next person. Um, and, and yeah, I think again, back to the, the point of coaching, uh, beyond the X's and O's, I think programming and coaching, they're, they're two distinct things, but there's a lot of, uh, carryover. Um, and how much time you spend in either one of these components, you know, programming or coaching is going to be dependent on the individual, uh, and where they're at in their fitness. But at the end of the day, I think your job as a coach should be shifting the balance towards just programming for people, you know, telling them what to do, guiding them, even not even programming, like letting them, you know, program themselves, selecting their own exercises, um, you know, what, how they want to progress and, you know, when they want to deload, things like this. Like it, it, it's more uh, of a bottoms up approach as opposed to a tops down approach uh, where the information and the, the decision making is coming from the, the client and the athlete, not necessarily the coach. Awesome stuff, guys. Uh, guys, this was great. Uh, I think it's probably a good place to wrap up. I know uh, you're getting a little sleepy over there, Jacob. <laughs> <laughs> Never, man. I don't sleep. I'll sleep. <laughs> hey, what are you drinking over there? Uh, Scotch and Coke. There you go. <laughs> Steve's like, what? <laughs> no, no, it's just Pepsi Max, bro. But it's no, all, screw it's your sleep up. What are you doing? <laughs> yeah, still lots of caffeine. I should have my um my goggles on, Steve. My my blue. Uh, yeah. My, <laughs> I just, no, I can wear those. They're acceptable because they're clear now. Actually, you're stepping up your fashion game. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. So uh, if you want to just plug where everybody can find us. So in my YouTube is Brains and Gains. The website is drdavemaconey.com. Uh, Steve, you want to go ahead? 
Cool, yeah. Thank you guys for this chat. It's been great. And Jacob finished on some really great points there. And I was just like nodding my head along to everything he was saying because that's exactly where we try and take our clients as well for the most part. Like you said, it doesn't apply to everyone. But yeah, for, for me, uh, Revive Stronger anywhere, basically. Search that and you'll find us Instagram, uh, YouTube, Facebook, all of those things. Jacob. Yeah. Thank you very much uh, for having me on, guys. I apologize for the, the lagging internet. I think a wombat ran into the, the phone <laughs> tower over there um, or a kangaroo knocked over my, uh, aid, my modem, so something happened. Um, but thank you for having me on. Uh, JPS Health and Fitness, yeah, search on any uh, social media platform and you'll probably find us. Uh, if not, that's totally cool. Go follow one of these lads and get plenty of good information from them.